Electronegativity, or the Greek, which is symbolized by the Greek letter chi, not x, is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract the shared electrons to itself. And you can kind of think of it like a tug of war. The greater the electronegativity of something, the more it's going to pull on those electrons, the more it's going to attract those electrons towards it. The values assigned to the electronegativity of something is based on the work of Linus Pauling, who developed a scale from 0 to 4, with 4 being the most electronegative and 0 being the least. You'll notice that on this table or on this, on this picture that the noble gases are missing. And this is because noble gases react so rarely that they do not have an electronegativity assigned to them. Fluorine has the greatest electronegativity because fluorine has the smallest radius and the greatest nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge. This means that fluorine's valence electrons are very heavily attracted by the nucleus of fluorine because the nucleus of fluorine is very near its valence electrons. You'll also notice that francium and cesium are among the smallest electronegativity. And this is because they are the largest atoms. There are many shells that surround their nuclei that prevent any outside electrons from being attracted to the nucleus. The greater the distance, the less attractive forces there are. You can use electronegativity to determine if a bond is polar, nonpolar, or ionic. And this is done through a difference in their electronegativities of the two molecules that are in the bond. For any diatomic compound, or two elements that are found very near each other on the periodic table, they will typically form nonpolar bonds because the difference between their electronegativities are going to be less than 0.4. If you have a difference of electronegativity less than 0.4, then you form a nonpolar covalent bond, meaning there's an equal sharing of electrons around both nuclei. Both nuclei are attracting nucle the electrons so that the electron density is equal around both. If the difference in electronegativity is greater than 0.4 but less than 1.67, you form a polar covalent bond where there's less electrons around one nuclei, and there's a greater density of electrons around the other. The, ele the atom with the greatest electronegativity will draw more electrons towards it, developing a partial positive charge. We symbolize this partial positive with the lowercase delta, which looks like a low, which looks like an S, because it's sort of negative. There's a greater density of electrons around the partial negative when compared to the partial positive. So we have two poles, we call this a polar compound, which is exactly what happens in the bond between hydro hydrogen and oxygen in the hydroxide. We can symbolize this movement of electrons with an arrow, where the arrow points towards where the electrons are going, and the plus side is where there's the partial positive. So in the case of hydrogen and oxygen, we point an arrow towards oxygen, and put the plus sign over, over hydrogen because it has the partial positive charge. In the event that you have a, a difference in electronegativity greater than 1.67, you form an ionic bond. For example, sodium chloride. Sodium has an electronegativity of 0 0.9 and chlorine has an electronegativity of 3, so a difference of 2.1. These are an ion. These form an ionic bond. Most bonds are in between purely ionic and purely covalent. The, pure, the polarity of a bond can be estimated by the change in the, the difference in electronegativity over the sum of the electronegativity. And is a range from 0 to 1, where 0 is, completely co, is a completely pure covalent bond and 1 is completely ionic. Because of the, the great difference in electronegativities between uh, the molecules that form an ionic bond, the, sorry, the elements that form an ionic bond. Ionic bonds have a massive amount of bond energy. 
in fact, we rename it and we call it a crystal, we call it the lattice energy because they form a crystal lattice. And any attempt to break an ionic bond, it will require you to break this lattice energy. We sometimes can refer to it as the enthalpy of dissociation. And it's the energy required to decompose an ion pair back into its ions. And therefore is a measure of the strength of an ionic bond. Basically, it's how much energy you need to melt it. And in fact, with sodium chloride, you can see the lattice energy is massive, 788 kilojoules for every one mole of sodium chloride. And this energy can be approximated from Coulomb's law, where the energy of attraction depends on the magnitude of the charges. The higher the charges, the greater the attractive energy, and the inverse of the distance between them. The larger the ion, the smaller the dissociation energy, or sorry, the enthalpy of dissociation, or the lattice energy. So that's why sodium chloride will have a massive dissociation energy, a massive a lattice energy, when compared to, say, something that's larger, like mm, francium sulfate, or francium, sorry, let's pick something in the same group, francium iodate. Because while their charges may be the same, the radius, the distance between the nuclei is much, 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 much greater. So the ion attractions have a great effect on the melting points. So that's why ionic bonds have massive melting points. However, ionic bonds are often soluble because water can move in and be attracted to the negative ends or the negative anions and the positive cations and surround it and hydrate the solution and pull those molecules apart. However, the larger those atoms, larger those elements, the more water that needs to surround it in order to pull it apart. The rest of this unit will be talking about covalent bonds. So I hope you enjoyed your brief and hopefully happy introduction to ionic bonds.